After just two weeks, SpaceX completed repairs to the 230-foot Super Heavy Booster 7's seemingly irreparable issue. So what went wrong with B7, and how did SpaceX fix it? But more importantly, will B7 be able to fly? All this and more in today's episode of Great SpaceX. Super Heavy Booster 7 or B-7, left the high bay it was assembled in for the first time on March 31st, and rolled a few miles down the road to nearby Starship launch and test facilities on a set of self-propelled mobile transporters, or SPMTs. On April 2nd, the roughly 230-foot rocket was installed on top of Starbase's Lone Orbital Launch Mount, or OLM setting the stage for crucial qualification testing. The start of that process was exceptionally successful. After minor tests on the stand, Booster 7 finally managed some significant testing on April 14th. Judging by the rhythmic shattering of ice that built up on Super Heavy's tanks, the test stand was able to simulate the thrust of Raptors to some degree and subject the booster to major mechanical stress that was felt from tip to tail. Within a few days, Booster 7 was removed from the test stand and returned to the high bay on April 18th. Around April 21st or 22nd, an image was leaked showing extensive damage inside B7, confirming that the Super Heavy's test campaign had been forced to end prematurely. Right away, the damage shown in the photo hinted at an operational failure, meaning that mistakes made by the rocket's operators may have been more to blame than a possible design flaw. The photo shows a short portion of B7's liquid methane transfer tube that runs through the booster's new liquid oxygen header tank, which itself sits inside Super Heavy's main liquid oxygen tank at the aft end of the rocket, or in layman's terms, a tube inside a small tank inside a large tank. Super Heavy's liquid methane transfer tube generally does what it says, allowing methane to safely fly down through the main liquid oxygen tank and fuel up to 33 Raptor engines. At full thrust, that tube would need to supply around 20 tons of methane per second. However, on top of merely transferring methane through the oxygen tank, Booster 7 introduced a design change that allows some or all of that tube to change functions and become a header tank mid-flight. That would require a system of valves that could seal off the main liquid methane tank once it was emptied, turning the transfer tube into a sort of giant steel straw filled with enough liquid methane to fuel Super Heavy's boost back and landing burns. It was the transfer tube that was damaged in the leaked photo of Booster 7, which doesn't look unlike what one might expect to see if they sucked through one end of a straw while blocking the other end collapsing the center. When we translate to the scale of Super Heavy, after an otherwise successful day of structural testing, SpaceX operators may have accidentally closed or opened the wrong valves, while draining the booster's transfer tube of liquid oxygen or nitrogen. As the heavy liquid drained from the tube, a lack of pressure equalization could have quickly drawn a vacuum and caused the tube to implode. On April 29th, Zach Golden, a SpaceX fan turned analyst published an analysis that convincingly pinpointed the moment Booster 7's transfer tube collapsed. Simultaneously, because it showed that the transfer tube likely imploded during detanking, the analysis more or less confirmed the aforementioned speculation that the failure had been caused by a degree of operator error or poor test design. Of course, it's possible that a hardware or software design flaw contributed to or caused the anomaly, or that something like a pressure differential in the liquid oxygen header tank and liquid methane header tube could also explain the damage, but the accidental formation of a vacuum during detanking is arguably the simplest explanation. After the image of the internal damage leaked, the immediate consensus among fans and close followers was that Booster 7 was beyond repair. However, SpaceX has proven those assumptions wrong, and somehow managed to repair the upgraded Super Heavy to the point that it was worth testing again just two weeks after returning to the high bay. On May 6th, B7 was rolled back to the launch site and installed, 
for the second time on the orbital launch mount. Space enthusiasts captured a stunning video of the gigantic rocket transported to the launch pad. Later, another cryo-proof test was underway on B7. Luckily, all went well. Prior to the failure, the general expectation was that SpaceX would begin installing Raptor version 2 engines as soon as B7 passed structural testing. It remains to be seen if SpaceX wants to repeat Booster 7's crow proof or structural testing to ensure that its quick repairs did the job before proceeding into static fire testing as previously planned. Nonetheless, there is a sign showing that SpaceX is aiming for a static fire test. The Raptor install platform made its way over to the orbital launch mount. We will likely see the three center engines mounted soon for a static fire test. Of course, these runs require SpaceX to notify the local authorities of road closures. All of this points towards the end goal, the first orbital flight of SpaceX's Starship. President Gwynne Shotwell revealed in a Thursday interview that SpaceX's flagship rocket will conduct a test flight from Texas in June or July. However, the rocket's crucial return to the pad comes as SpaceX moves forward with another regulatory application for a test flight. This application sees SpaceX request the FCC's permission to add another frequency to transfer data to the Starship vehicle for an orbital flight test. It will be valid for six months, starting on the 21st of this month, and is required so that the Commission can coordinate with federal radio frequency users such as NASA and the United States Department of Defense. Starship's launch frequencies were detailed in a SpaceX filing to the FCC made in 2020. The FCC granted approval to SpaceX for adding another frequency band recently, with the approval coming at a time when the company's pending environmental review at the FAA also moved forward. As part of its review, the FAA has to consult with several government agencies for their opinion on a launch site harming the environment after four delays. Out of the five separate sub-reviews for Boca Chica, Texas, four have been completed, with the latest being a consultation mandated under the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. This only leaves the Environmental Assessment, or EA, that comes solely under the purview of the FAA, and the agency currently expects this to be finished on the 31st of this month. If we're lucky, the FAA will greenlight SpaceX, and our long-awaited flight won't be far away. And that's it for today's episode. If you enjoy what my team and I are doing, you can become a patron through our Patreon link in the description below. And as a quick note, if you have advertising needs, you can contact us directly via email. As always, this is Kevin with Great SpaceX, and my team and I will see you next time. Thank you so much for watching.